Um, Chernobyl, you've heard a great deal about. I want to call your attention to this passage from a 1991 document, uh, five years after Chernobyl, uh, from the IAEA, Atomic Energy Agency, on the basis of the doses estimated by the project teams and currently accepted radiation risk estimates, future increases over the natural incidence of cancers or hereditary effects would be difficult to discern even with large and well-designed long-term epidemiologic studies. And you've seen a plethora of information uh, today and yesterday that this turned out not to be so. Um, just as one graph, I, I won't dwell on it, uh, from a thyroid cancer study which had individual dose estimates including um, information from uh, scans, thyroid scans. Uh, another uh, nuclear event uh, where we were told there could possibly, no, that there were no cancer effects possible was the Three Mile Island nuclear accident in 1979. Um, I have just a few photos here from Bob Del Tredici, his book, The People of Three Mile Island, to give you a sense of uh, what the area was like in 1979. People lived quite close to the plant. Um, many reported uh, symptoms of, such as uh, reddening of the skin, deaths of pets and animals, nausea and vomiting, hair loss, um, and they were told that uh, this was due to stress. Now, um, I started working on this because of a lawsuit that involved several thousand people. And I first did look into stress. I think it's, stress is very important. And I'm sure the people of Three Mile Island were under a tremendous amount of stress. However, my assessment of the medical literature was that their reports did not fit the scenario of stress-induced acute effects, um, sometimes called mass hysteria in the medical literature. So uh, we conducted a reanalysis of data on cancer incidents that were collected from local hospitals uh, during, during the period 1975 to 85, and um, dose estimates made by the investigators, and we found uh, and, and I want to point out one thing, that this study was designed to avoid a, a problem that's a big concern in any well-publicized event, which is that there's detection bias. People report sooner, they get more diagnostic tests, so we expect there to be an effect of detection bias on the disease incidence rate following an event like this. Everyone in this study was within 10 miles. They were all ex exposed to the same detection bias. This is a, a graph showing our results. The radiation doses in the area are shown from very low in the green to uh, high in the deep red. And the bars indicate the uh, relative rates of lung cancer that occurred between two and seven years after the event. And what's very clear is that the lung cancer incidence rates uh, rose dramatically in the direction of the plumes, where the plumes from the uh, emissions were estimated to have traveled in the first days of the accident. And again, the risk projections s said there would be no effects. Um, next, I want to uh, mention studies of uh, routinely operating nuclear power plants, which is a topic of current interest in the uh, National Academy of Sciences. Tim Musa, who spoke yesterday, has been on their panel. Uh, they, this is also a situation where the projection is that no cancers will be observed following or among people who are exposed to routinely operating reactors. Um, and so, a study like European studies has never been done in the U.S. I brought one example of a study of childhood leukemia in, in Germany. These are the study areas around their 16 nuclear plants. And this table shows that 
uh, in the zero to five age group, uh, the uh, rate ratio, relative risk, or odds ratio, all equivalent here. In the five, the zero to five kilometer zone, it's a, more than a doubling of childhood leukemia incidents in this, these areas collectively compared to the areas of further away. And, and in each case, the comparison group is not from some other place. It's, they're also uh, in the same areas, cases and controls in this study. So the authors conclude radiation exposure near German nuclear power plants is a factor of 1,000 to 100,000 times less than annual average exposure from medical exams. Therefore, the observed positive distance trend remains unexplained. And I, I feel that I'm repeating uh, in some ways what we heard earlier this morning from Dr. Wordelecki, that um, we're, we're not able to conclude uh, anything from the studies that have been done because they don't comport with the projections from the A-bomb survivor studies. Um, yesterday, uh, Dr. Brenner compared the radiation risks to deaths from violence and the earthquake and tsunami in Fukushima. Um, and I, I think he has a point. But I would uh, ask the question, what's the difference between these energy generation and medical irradiation from that ma matter uh, energy generation is highly profitable, and it's a public decision made by politicians who are in many cases tied to nuclear companies and weapons contractors that created the nuclear energy industry in the first place. Um, there's been discussion of public education, and I would argue, yes, we need public ed education, uh, not only about radiation, but about science, and about civic life, because our science is affected by our political system. Um, in Fukushima, uh, in Fukushima, there will be extra challenges to epidemiologic studies when we compare the situation to the others I've mentioned today, um, and that have been mentioned here earlier. Uh, and some of those challenges involve the fact that there was an earthquake and a tsunami, and there were huge disruptions of, of living conditions. There was a lot of uh, relocation. People were moving around. Estimating doses for individuals, which is important and critical in epidemiologic studies, will be made very much more difficult. Um, in Fairly showed just recently uh, time trends in infant mortality, and we could look for other time trends. And let's remember that radiation was not the only thing going on at, at, that was uh, different after this event. People were moving, they were relocating, their diets were affected, their medical services were affected. Uh, people died. Many, many thousands of people died. Uh, so this is all going on at the same time, and it's going to be difficult to separate out the radiation effects from this. Uh, one of the things I think is very important is that uh, there are risks from conducting research. And some research can be designed in such a way that it is unable to detect an effect, even if the effect is there. This is something that the exposed populations need to understand, because if they're if they come to count on science to help them, they need to know that science isn't perfect and it's never done in perfect conditions. Um, there were also comments yesterday uh, and earlier today about bias and objectivity in science. And I would like to uh, leave you with the idea that, that the main threat here is a lack of critical thinking and that this includes self-critical thinking. Uh, and in this area that we're interested in here at the symposium, I think one primary problem is the failure to question authority. And that is a, a great example to me is the lifespan study, which is applied all the time, every day, 
from legal situations to workers' compensation to estimating health effects of, of the Fukushima events. And authority is very important because authorities control access to jobs, to research funding, professional meetings and journals. Uh, Tim Musso talked about this yesterday. Uh, what we're trying to do is very difficult. It's not easy. Um, but as we proceed to get more information on the effects of Fukushima to learn more about the population impacts, one of the things that I would ask is that we not confuse narrowly constructed research hypotheses, meaning that there would be an excess of some condition in an exposed population. Let's not confuse that with the systemic analyses that we are also interested in. Things like, uh, is nuclear power a good policy? That's a different question. If nuclear power is a bad policy, it doesn't mean that every study has to find an excess cancer. That's a different question. So uh, with that, I'll uh, thank you for your attention and uh, maybe talk to you later. Thank you, Steve. Um, I don't think there's really any need for me to highlight any points. You did a very good job at the end there, and I think that's an important thing that we'll take with us um, through the rest of the symposium, and hopefully as we leave here for the rest of our lives. 